Hello and welcome to the latest iFormulate Introduces webinar. Today we'll be taking a look at the topic of open innovation and how it can work across the boundaries of different sectors. My name is Jim Bullock from iFormulate and joining us today is Dr. Malcolm McKechnie, one of iFormulate's associate partners. Uh, Malcolm brings us his experience gained from technology sourcing roles in pharmaceuticals and fast-moving consumer goods at Reckitt Ben Kieser, as well as from uh, outwardly facing technology roles at BP and Brewing Research International. Malcolm will talk about the benefits of carrying out open innovation across sector boundaries. I will then provide two short case studies of how iFormulate has assisted pharmaceutical and other chemical using companies to do just that. This webinar will last 45 minutes and is being recorded, so it will be made available to all of you participants afterwards. And if you'd like to ask questions, please use the GoToWebinar question or chat functions that you can see in your GoToWebinar box, and we will endeavor to ask, answer those questions at the end. We will keep you muted as the audience to pre prevent any background noise. Uh, this uh, webinar will last 45 minutes. So just before we start, a little bit of information about iFormulate. We're a fairly young company founded by two experienced industry professionals. We've just celebrated our third birthday, in fact. We bring our own experience and knowledge, again, across many different industries and in varied functional roles, and combine them with the expertise of our associate partners, all in order to assist our clients. We divide our activities into three business areas. In iFormulate Consult, which is the relevant area for today's webinar, we carry out innovation and technology consulting, mainly in the area of formulation technology, for client companies in private sector industry. As iFormulate Strategic, we've carried out and assisted strategic projects in the area of formulation for sector bodies and associations, such as the National Tran the Knowledge Transfer Nas Network, the National Formulation Center, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. And under I Formulate Skills, we design, deliver, and promote training courses and programs in formulation science and technology, which may appear under our own banner, or may be in partnership with third parties. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Malcolm McKechnie, who will tell us about cross-sector technology transfer. Malcolm. Uh, good day to everybody. What I want to do over the next 20 minutes or so is really just to look at open innovation with a particular emphasis on how technology transfer from other sectors can actually be a very useful component of your strategy. Can I have the next slide, Jim? So what, I, what I'll be covering will be, first of all, open innovation. I'll just start with a generic definition of that. I'll look at a little bit to set the scene as to why companies use open innovation, and then go on to what, where, and how to look with a focus on sectorial transfer. I'll give you a few example sectors that are adjacent to each other and a couple of technology transfer areas just as examples to stimulate your thought processes. They're not ones that I necessarily would expect you to just go out and say, well, that's a good idea. We'll look at those. It's just thoughts and processes on that. And then at the end, I just want to talk about the challenges because it isn't always plain sailing and there is really a need to develop a mutual understanding between the partners to ensure success. I will primarily be covering a seeker's view, and by that I mean those who want a technology or want a process. The discussion will, to some extent, will cover offers, i.e. those people who are trying to give a technology. It will cover that side of the fence as well, but to a lesser extent. Go to the next slide, Jim. OK, I'm going to define open innovation. Um, as the definition promoted by Henry Chesper, who really was the first academic to look seriously at the processes, at the culture, at the philosophy behind open innovation. Although many companies were practicing it before um, he defined that term, he is, he is seen as the 
first academic really to put it all together in a structured way and look at it. So his definition of open innovation, which is a, a good succinct one, is really just simply saying companies do not rely entirely on their own research, but by a licensed process of inventions from outside their own organization, i.e. outward facing. But what's important is that has to be combined, the external input has to be combined with internal ideas to advance a company's technology. It's very rare you're going to go out and find an exact this will do, I can run with it immediately. So you do need to have the internal focus which would uh, allow you to use external technology. In addition, there is also the opportunity for many companies to use uh, open innovation to take ideas that they are not using in their own business, to take them outside the company and offer them up for sale or in exchange. The important thing about that is it may be that they are, are using a technology but in a single defined sector and they're quite willing to license it out in other sectors that are not competitive. So even if you're using a technology in your sector, there's still always the opportunity to license it out into non-competing sectors. That really is just the way I wanted to set the scene on open innovation and just set the scene on outward facing. Could I have the next slide, Jim? So what needs does open innovation typically meet? Well, obviously, actively seek external partners to fuel internal innovation. I split it down into four really broad generic areas, starting with the one on the top left in that circle, solve. Very simple one. You have a problem. You're looking for a solution to a problem or a need that you've not been able to solve in-house. You may not have the resources in-house. You may not have the time frame to do it in-house. So you put a brief for the technology or you exploit your network to say, I need one of these. Who's got one that I can have? It may be that you define that as a series of needs like the perfect need, one that would do, and one that might also be a reasonable fit you could work up in-house. So there's degrees of posting that solution. The other area, bottom left, is a threat or opportunity. You, your area may be under threat because somebody has launched a disruptive technology. You may need to go outside to try and find a response to that because it may be that your own resources or your own knowledge hasn't got expertise in that particular disruptive technology. It also may be that while you're out looking externally, you may discover a technology that you feel could be disruptive. So looking at disruptive technologies in your sector, they can either be a threat and you might need to go outside to respond to that or you could find an opportunity. The other area top right is a more interesting one. I'll talk about this in the next slide in a little bit more detail. New product opportunity. You may receive or find or come across a technology, a process, a concept, whatever it is. You say, wow, that's fascinating. I'm not quite sure how can we use that. What can it do for us? So there are opportunities out there where the stimulus, it may not be exactly what you want, it may not even be something you thought of, but you can use it to generate concepts and ideas. And the last thing on the bottom right of that circle is license, which we've talked about on the previous slide. Licensing out on use technology or brands. So simplistically, I've broken down open innovation into four broad areas, and within those there are many, many subsections. I have the next slide, Jim. So I just want to take a little bit more time to look at solution versus opportunity because they do need handling in different ways. Solution, you're looking for something, it's well defined. We need one of these. How do we do this? Is there an alternative way? It might be that you have a regulatory issue, you have a patent issue. That, you allows you, that might not allow you to do exactly what you want to do. You need an alternative way. It might be you've got a marketing concept you don't have a technology for. But the difference here is with a solution, you can prepare quite a detailed brief of what you are looking for. And you can post it externally. And then you can filter the inputs you get from your external networks based on the brief. On the opportunity side, I touched on this on the previous slide. You may come across a technology and it may simply be, wow, that's, that's interesting. What on earth could we use that for? 
And this is where other sectors may start to come in. Other sectors may have different approaches and technologies to solve a similar problem to your own. And the point of that is, it's not just technology seeking and sourcing. Here, you may have the opportunity to look for a new offering or a new product concept. It might give you a new benefit that's been unarticulated by your market. It could be disruptive. So what we're saying here is, you have something that is interesting. You're not exactly sure how to place it within your sector or you know, it might have a benefit. And on the opportunistic side, this is where market research, consumer research, ideation, and concept evaluation are needed. So when you're looking outside, and when you're looking to other sectors, you may often come across opportunistic technologies. And I think it's important to look at the difference between the two. They need different internal processes to handle them. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say on that. Can I have the next slide, Jim? So, the next area is where to look. Well, the first thing is, if you look at the central um, circle, we're talking, first of all, about global technology sourcing. And that's simply because technology is now global. It knows no national or international boundaries. You, to be successful, you're better with a global reach in technology sourcing in open innovation. Also, to be successful, it's probably good that your network has a broad range of different providers and different networks to ensure that you get different approaches to a problem. It might include small medium enterprises, SMEs. You may go to a technology broker, solve a network or a consultant and brief them to go out on your behalf if you feel your network's not strong in a particular area. Venture capitalists are often funding new start businesses which may have an interesting technology. Government and European Union organizations and transnational organizations are very useful. For example, the European Union's um, enterprise network is a very interesting area. This technique needs websites where people have posted the need for a technology. You may have something you can offer to them in the licensing out area. Academic and technical institutions are very, very rich picking, picking areas, and it's very important you have a good network with them. You can simply mine intellectual property, loan inventors, and one interesting area is suppliers. Your supplier may have you in a consumer goods sector, an agrochemical sector, but that supplier, if they're big, may also be supplying processes, products, ingredients into other sectors. So your own supply chain can be quite interesting to review and say to your bigger suppliers, what have you got in an adjacent sector that may have similar technology platforms? And obviously that leads into the top left one in blue, the highlighted one, other industry sectors. It is expanding your network into those for stimulus and for problem solving with perhaps a slightly different philosophy. So what I'm trying to say here is the most successful open innovation strategies are global and are quite broad in their network capability. Could I have the next slide, Jim? Looking at um, the fact that you're going to source from many different areas, it's probably worth ensuring that the target partner you select meets your requirements. They're all going to have different statuses with regard to time frames, technology readiness, intellectual property, etc. And if you look at something at the bottom of this slide, say, existing suppliers, your existing suppliers likely to have the shortest time frame, will have the IP probably well defined, and the technical risk will be minimal because they've probably already scaled it up. So existing suppliers are likely to be quicker, but they might not quite be as um, radical in the approach. At the top, universities research institutes, they're going to have probably the longest time frame, probably the highest technical risk, but probably also the most ability to generate IP as you work with them, to generate and hold IP on your behalf or jointly with them. So there's two ends of the spectrum there. And it is important when you're briefing that you make sure you understand, are you looking for something that's high risk that's now? Are you looking for something that's low risk? You've really got to make sure that that's understood with regard to your technology supply chains. 
other sectors and industries sort of fit in the middle of that. Yes, it's likely to have been scaled up in another sector, but the chances are it probably will still need some further work with regard to regulatory issues in your own sector versus the sector you're looking at technologies from. And it may be that you need to strike a few deals with that um, company because they may not be in your normal supply network or supply chain. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is remember that where you look and what you look for, you need to also keep at the back of your mind always the technical risk, the IP, and the time frames to product on shelf. Could I have the next slide, Jim? So really, what I'm saying here is, and this is just, just building on the last two slides, and to summarize them, it's important that when you transfer across technology sectors that there should be a value both to the seeker of the technology, the process, or the concept, and the provider. Because not only are you going to solve a problem or have a new opportunity, the provider hopefully will start selling into a sector and have a market share that it didn't have previously. So it's an opportunity for win-win. And on the right-hand side at the bottom of that slide, I think it's important that conceptually, when you're out looking in other sectors, approach is not considered in your sector, but which have been used in adjacent sectors and may be of value. It may generate a whole new position for the product. It could generate a new consumer insight. It could generate a new benefit for the technology or a new benefit for the product, which you may have not thought of within your own sector's confines. Could I have the next slide, Jim? So why would you do it? Why is it of value to transfer from different sectors or cross sectors? Well, I think I've hinted at most of these throughout the previous slide. First of all, rapid ad adaptation of technology quicker to market. The chances are the ingredient, the process, or even the concept have probably already been looked at and might already have been scaled up in that sector. New way of thinking of technology benefits and consumer claims, and that is quite important sometimes in a crowded marketplace. The technology is likely to come with some regulatory safety, toxicology, environmental information developed, okay, for a specific sector, but a lot of that will be common. IP is already developed which means the technology is secure and you, you can secure a license. But there was probably also scope for further applications IP to build on that. And I mentioned this previously, win-win. The recipient has a new product concept and the provider hopefully has a new sector. And again, I will stress, it may tie back to your current supply chain because suppliers are often siloed into industry sectors. Uh, the next slide, Jim. So I'm now going to give you a few example adjacent sectors. Um, just before I go into those, um, let me say that non-adjacent sectors won't be as productive in the sense that there'll be hard work to find a few leads. Um, but if you find them, they may be much more creative. Uh, they're harder to handle internally in ideation terms, but they can lead to some very interesting stimulus. I'm talking about cross-adjacent sector here. So I'm looking at things like drug delivery, oil field chemistry, cosmetics, paints and coatings, food beverage confectionery, agrochemicals, and fast-moving consumer goods. And by that, I mean household cleaning, household detergents. So the reason I put those as adjacent is there's a lot of commonality in the technology platforms that they operate in. OK, they're all trying to deliver slightly different actives. They're all trying to get different benefits. But at the end of the day, they do have a whole range of um, overlapping technology areas. Can I have the next slide, Jim? I mean, if you start to look at these, and I've put fast-moving consumer goods, the household cleaning detergents in the middle, and looked at what do those other sectors have that could be of relevance. I'm not going to go through this list, but I'll give you some examples. Oil field chemistry. Scale control. Well, we know scale control is important in laundry detergents and general in household cleaning. Um, cosmetics. Sensorial effects. Yeah, there's a lot of sensorial effects in consumer goods. Um, there's a lot of um, novel formats that could be translated across. 
paints and coatings, functional effects, surface treatments, food and beverage, packaging, delivery, controlled release, agrochemicals, again, delivering actives, locking them onto surfaces, encapsulation and controlled release. If you look at those and you look at fast-moving consumer goods in the middle, you can see that there's a lot of overlapping technology platform areas, triggered, controlled, delayed release, targeting of actives, encapsulation and protection of actives, surface coating, dispersed phases, for example, emulsions, foams, particulate suspension, delivery systems and packaging, product formats, surface modification, lockdown of actives, product stability, sensorial effects, to name but a few. So that's the reason why adjacent sectors and cross-sector transfer can be interesting. There's a commonality in the technology platforms, but there isn't necessarily a commonality in the concepts that they are being used to tackle. What I want to do now on the next couple of slides is to give you a couple of examples. These are not examples that are, you know, necessarily I would expect them to go away and start looking at. They're examples just to get the thought processes and the philosophy um, if you like, looked at in a, a bit more detail. And I'm going to look at brewing and fast-moving consumer goods. One, one first one is enzymes. Enzymes are used in fast-moving consumer goods for stain removal and washing, in dishwashing and laundry detergents, primarily for stain, soil removal or fabric care. In brewing, a whole range of enzymes are available in the barley and in the malt, and they're used to break down complex carbohydrates to allow them to become fermentable products. They're also used as filtration improvements when you filter beer at the end of the process and clarify it to reduce the presence of viscous polysaccharides, which can cause filter blockage and pressure buildup. They're also used to remove carbohydrates in the production of lighter beers and to induce chill proofing using proteases. By chill proofing, I mean if you chill certain beers down very low, as seems to be the consumer preference, it can throw out a cloud of protein. Some of these enzymes are used to chill proof and to stop that happening. Also enzymes are used in food and brewing. In cleaning place, in detergents, they're used to clean the processing plant. So there's a very simple example of a common theme of enzymes to break down larger molecules, proteins and carbohydrates. There's information on different conditions, different compatibilities, different enzymes, different degrees of conversion, maybe lower or higher temperature enzyme used, or new enzyme classes which are well developed in one sector but not used in another. That's a relatively simplistic one. Could I have the, I'm going to stay, stick on the same one and look at a slightly more obtuse one, but again in fast-moving consumer goods and brewing. Could I have the next slide, Jim? So here we're looking at stain treatments and dye transfer. In um, laundry and in household cleaning, a lot of the stains are basically chromophores, which are coloured, and which are from tea, wine, coffee, and fruit juices, and they're polyphenolic in nature, and they're typically exemplified by the tannins. If you look at beer, um, beer stabilisation, to make beer last longer on the shelf, a lot of removal of polyphenols, oxidised and polymerised polyphenol classes, um, is needed to make sure that the beer doesn't go cloudy, doesn't throw a haze, and in fact has the right taste profile. And that is handling of polyphenols by resorbing them out of the system by using a polyvinyl pyrrolidone cross-linked polymer. Beer is simply stirred with that or filtered through it, and a lot of the polyphenols are removed. What's interesting there is chemistry similar to polyvinyl pyrrolidone is used in consumer goods to mop up dyes that are released from clothing and washing to stop the white um, clothing going, say, pink if you happen to wash red with it. So there's a knowledge here of polyphenols that's different approaches on the knowledge of polyphenolic chemistry. There's knowledge here on dye transfer inhibition in fast-moving consumer goods in laundry where the brewing industry have used similar actives to remove polyphenols and stop them transferring. So what we're saying is both coloured stains and both dye transfer, there are some 
cross-sector technology common themes here that may be quite interesting to look at a completely different approach to it. Could I have the next slide, Jim? So really, that was just two very specific examples, just to give you some thoughts on how to think generically across sectors. What I really want to finish with with my particular section is what are the common challenges? If you find the technology in another sector and you're trying to access it and do a deal with somebody, the most common one is misaligned expectations. Your sector may have a different complete completely different royalty rate profile to the one that you are sourcing the technology from. So there may be a fact that you're going to pay a royalty for the technology, and it may not be as high as was expected. IP ownership. If you develop some new IP, who's going to own it? Joint? Either partner with a sub-license back? And then time scale of commercialization and revenue generation. Because it's cross-sector transfer, there is often an expectation it will be very rapid. Oh yes, it can be very rapid, but if there's a regulatory hurdle to cross, it can still take a little bit of time. Test data and validation data may require specific industry tests that haven't been done in the sector you're transferring the technology from. And this may be a specific test for a consumer claim or for the regulatory claim. Registration legislation in each sector may be different. There's often a cultural mismatch, especially if it's a large multinational and an SME. Large multinationals are very nimble and may have to move extremely quickly with multi-focus on many products, and they may suddenly decide that's not relevant anymore, or they may have a different priority, whereas a small medium enterprise may have a very specific narrow focus, and may, you know, which they're pushing very hard. So there's often just a cultural mismatch. And change in business priorities is very common with the way that technology is moving so quickly. Um, there's often a discussion started, a piece of technology transfers commence, and suddenly it no longer becomes relevant, or a disruptive technology has appeared which makes that inappropriate. So there are a lot of optimism. There's a lot of optimistic views for tech cross-sector technology transfer, but there are still a lot of challenges that must always be borne in mind. So I think I'm going to hand over this next slide to Jim. Basically, that's all I wanted to say, just to set the scene and whet your appetite on cross-sector technology transfer, the benefits and a few of the pitfalls that can occur with it, and how it fits into your own open innovation strategy. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Malcolm. So Malcolm's started to mention the potential pitfalls of open innovation done in this way. Uh, and I'd like now to talk about uh, what, what can be done about that. So Malcolm's talked about uh, concerns about IP on, on, and uh, secrecy, how open can open innovation actually be. There may be disparity in the stakes, the size, the objectives and the approaches of the different partners. You might have, for instance, a large multinational company who's seeking new technologies from a very small technology provider. So what's life or death for the small provider might just turn out to be yeah, just another interesting project on a, on a, on a long list for the multinational. And there's always the need in any partnership to build up trust. I'd like to start with a couple of case studies. So in the first case study, um, I'll be talking about um, uh, a set of open innovation roadshows where uh, I formulate assisted cl clients at the beginning, at the early stages of the open innovation process. Uh, and this really ad addresses the, the problem solving opportunity that, uh, that Malcolm mentioned. Uh, and, and the uh, potential for open innovation to give stimulus to researchers and technologists in a company. So how can we avoid the pitfalls of open innovation? We can do that, first of all, by sharing challenges and uh, for the format to make sure that each party contributes and potentially benefits in equal measure. So each party's risking the same, really. We can bring in parties from non-competing industries. Uh, those participants will have common scientific and technological challenges of the sorts that Malcolm's talked about. But there's no interest at all in the IP 
for the other industries. You're just not competing with these other people. You have no interest in their industry. You have an interest in the science and technology. You need to make the ground rules clear for that to happen, of course. Uh, and, and trust is important. You need to take time to, to get to know your opposite numbers and to understand how their business works. And in the Open Innovation Roadshows, we're able to make that happen in a number of ways. We put together for four participant companies a series of open innovation workshops. They were invitation-only workshops uh, focused around the area very broadly of formulation science and technology. These were four multinationals with a significant depth in science and engineering. So they were comparable companies, if you like. That parity is quite important. This format could work with smaller companies, but those, those companies would need to be broadly comparable in terms of their, uh, of their depth of knowledge and what they could contribute and what they might gain from the, from the, from the format. That parity is important. We chose uh, four companies from four different industries that didn't compete with each other, so from the food and beverage sector, from pharmaceuticals, from crop protection, and from home and personal care. We developed the format for the roadshows with the companies. We didn't use any non-disclosure agreements for the roadshows. We used the Chatham House Rule, and the Chatham House Rule is a way of sharing relevant industry information within a forum. It doesn't bind the participants not to disclose the information, but if they do disclose that information, they shouldn't divulge the identity of the speaker or their affiliation or divulge who else was participating in the forum. So it's a way of sharing industry relevant information up to a certain level. Now for these roadshows, each company hosted a roadshow in turn uh, and attendees from the other companies joined those roadshow events. We worked together with the host to uh, help set technical challenges for their particular roadshow that was specifically relevant to their businesses and their projects uh, at the time. We put together small group sessions for uh, exchange of ideas and experience. And we developed within those groups areas of common interest for collaboration. So that was the technical side, if you like, a sharing of technical challenge. But it wasn't just purely about the technical side of things. So we made sure that trust was built up, networking opportunities were provided through uh, providing a dinner for the at attendees, for instance, or the host providing a, a dinner for the attendees from the, the other companies. Uh, the host on the day provided a scene setting, keynote presentation, giving a picture of their business, the big picture of the industry, scene setting, and there were opportunities during the day for lab and for plant visits. Um, the outcomes of those roadshows were quite significant. So over those four roadshows, which we held over an extended period of about 11 months, there were 108 attendances at those four workshops. Those attendees were mainly R&D scientists and engineers, but they also included, uh, and that added greatly, I think, to the discussion, commercial supply chain, manufacturing and open innovation practitioners. Uh, we worked on, in, in all over those workshops, uh, 15 different company challenges on a variety of different topics, uh, which were common to, to all the companies concerned. So things like stabilization, microstructure, delivery, processing, End user, end user experience and so on. Um, this enabled a huge amount of experience sharing, contact sharing and idea generation amongst the parties uh, and suggestion for follow-up uh, options. And we identified at the end of the program six concrete project areas for potential collaborative projects to be worked up. So these were discussions that those companies would normally not have had with each other. Those individuals wouldn't normally have known each other. They were working across different industries completely. They wouldn't have met at industry events, for instance, but they were able to work in this forum together on common technical challenges. So there were countless one-to-one -one discussions, informally, if you like, and several offline meetings between participant companies. Uh, we uh, observed some benefits, but also some uh, some surprises, really, from, from, the, uh, from the format. The Participant companies obviously need to be committed, and we made sure that each uh, company had a named leader for the roadshows. Um, we managed the selection of the topics and of the participants very carefully before the roadshow event. All participants saw this as a very highly effective and cost-effective uh, way of exchanging information and, and gaining knowledge very, very quickly, uh, as well as opening up collaboration opportunities. We observed a very high degree of openness and trust uh, and a really beneficial 
technical exchange, which we expected between the specialists. What we didn't expect, which, which was also a benefit, was that the companies were able to use these roadshows as a development opportunity for their less experienced employees. So they, it was a crash course, if you like, for some of those employees to bring them up to speed technically in a number of areas that were new to them. And actually, another unexpected uh, benefit was that companies were able to uh, improve their communication internally because they brought together people from different sites, perhaps, perhaps on the day, and, and uh, also uh, when they were visiting other companies who maybe day to day wouldn't talk to each other about their problems and their challenges. And that was extremely helpful as well. These discussions we found were much more wide ranging than expected. We'd expected the R&D. What we hadn't expe expected so much, which was very pleasing, were discussions on customer experience, on things like regulations, manufacturing and supply chain. So that's the formulation uh, Open Innovation Roadshows. In the targeted innovation workshops, uh, this was a, a more focused uh, problem solving activity. Um, uh, where a specific company, a large pharmaceutical company, commissioned our, us to assist with um, new ideas and technologies, new contacts and project building to support uh, the development of a very specific theme related to sensorial properties of their products. That company recognized an opportunity to leverage the industry expertise across from other industries for, for, for mutual benefit. Uh, and uh, we, we agreed that the chosen theme that they had had links to a lot of required technical expertise that we, we knew about in the food and beverage sector. And the objective of this exercise was to identify consortia and interest groups for future collaborative projects. Um, so the steps that we took, first of all, we researched the theme offline and identified centers of expertise individuals and technologies. We focused on the food and the pharmaceutical industries. We uh, included academics, big companies and small companies within this. Uh, and we um, focused on expertise that we believe would be new to the client. At the end of that short stage, we produced a report with some recommendations to the clients and agreed with them the format for the workshop. Um, then, again, an invitation-only event. We hosted an invitation-only ev only event together with the clients. Um, and the client also brought some along some some attendees that they were interested in, in, in uh, attending as well. So invitation only event, very, very focused, one day only. Uh, and at the end of that, there was a, a final report and some follow up activities. So the outcomes of this, the workshop, well, we saw 25 people there uh, just for a single day. We saw scientists from the client companies, but we also saw academics. Uh, research institutes with a focus on, on food and beverages. Uh, we brought in innovative SMEs in the food and the pharma industry, as well as other pharmaceutical collaborators, uh, CROs and big pharma and so on. Um, so that was a, a, a good mix of participants. We started off with a structured networking session, a getting to know you session, and then the host introduced the theme and the relevance to their industry. We then broke down into two small uh, group sessions to work up some of those themes in more detail. So the host explained it, the, the context of the theme and the importance in more detail. We then talked about different approaches to, to tackle the topic. A whole load of idea generation w w was possible at that stage, uh, and, and actually education took place at that stage. So, for instance, very often what we saw here was that the food experts were really educating the pharmaceutical experts about sensorial uh, properties, which was extremely beneficial. At the end of the day, there was a large group wrap-up session where ideas could be developed and interest groups could be identified. So looking at the follow-up and the benefits, all attendees found the uh, workshop beneficial. So the client identified significant areas uh, of new expertise and new understanding, um, which was of value to them and, and which they could uh, follow up offline, if you like. Um, but also the other attendees uh, were able to uh, obtain new contacts and potential collaboration and development partners as well. In concrete terms, the workshop identified three separate technical themes and also identified members of potential R&D uh, collaboration consortia, which were then developed uh, separately outside the event. So that was a way of bringing in resource. And, and bringing in uh, expertise that was new to the host company. 
so in summary then, uh, looking back at the two targeted uh, formats that we're talking about here, there is potential ven venue. In this case, we, we focused a fair bit on pharmaceuticals for pharmaceuticals and related areas in new innovation models. Two of those new innovation models that we talked about, the Open Innovation Roadshow and the Cross Industry Targeted Innovation Workshop. The topics can be the most obvious technical common areas that we, we know about, for instance, in this case, very often formulation science and technology, but they can also encompass you know, quite broad ranging areas of manufacturing, quality, uh, consumer experience, logistics and supply chain. The real benefits and opportunities that you get from participating in this kind of activity, you bring in that expertise and that knowledge that Malcolm described from other industries. There's the ability to le leverage the collective resource. You're sharing a task between you, really. You're expanding the personal development uh, uh, network, so you're, you're really creating opportunity for personal development through that, those, that networking exercise. Uh, and, and these uh, formats can enable, um, you know, quite significant consortia to be built up and collaborations to be built. It can benefit companies that are large and small and, and can be benefit uh, institutes and academia as well. Those models can be adapted, of course. Those are just two examples. They can be adapted to suit specific participants' need. You just need to ask us about that. Um, so before we get on to the questions, and just a reminder that you're able to use, if you wish, the, the question and chat functions on your GoToWebinar, box in a moment so get your you, you can start putting in your questions now if you like I just wanted to finish off really by talking about other ways we can help you if you're thinking about getting into open innovation or you've Im started to implement open innovation and need think you might need to some advice to evaluate your open innovation processes or to help you design or improve your open innovation processes we're able to help you there we're able to conduct technology profiling assignments, for instance, answering the questions. We need some new ideas for our development program, a scouting question, if you like. We want to know about the pros and cons of particular technology. Who should we talk to? What markets might we want to enter with our technology, markets that are new to us? All of these questions are the sorts of things that we get asked on technology profiling assignments. In specific problem solving assignments, very often we get a very specific question. We've got a problem, we need some help to solve it or we need some help to develop a new, a new product, for instance. And, and finally, there's always, always the option of training. And apart from our, our, our open courses, we can also work to design custom in-house training with, with clients as well. So there's some ways that you might want to engage with us. Um, thank you for listening to today. We're very nearly at the end of our time. I just wanted to give you an opportunity now for those remaining attendees here uh, to ask any questions. We have a question function. Um, uh, and I'm looking at the question function now. I'm seeing a question or two coming in. I'm going to uh, answer the first question that I see. Let me just uh, expand on that question. So Peter is asking the question, I like the use of Chatham House rules, but how soon did parties find that they needed to strike uh, a an agreement well those agreements uh, when they took place were after the event so uh, on the day uh, it was very possible to be quite open uh, technically because you're really bringing a lot of people up to speed with new science and technology so on the day there was a huge amount of openness the confidentiality agreements took place in separate discussions after the day they were quite often bilateral discussions so on the day um, you can do quite a lot without a uh, confidentiality agreement. Or, or in your case, I think you answered the question, a gain sharing agreement. So that's, a, that's about uh, IP, I guess, uh, and, and licensing. But that was, that was uh, some time after the, uh, after the discussions. I'm looking to see now in the chat function or the question functions if any more questions are coming in. Uh, I'll give you one last opportunity. I don't see any more. So at this stage, I'd just like to say thank you very much for attending today. You can see our contact details in front of you. Uh, the next iFormulate webinar will be in February, on, on the 4th of February, where um, we will have a webinar that's sponsored by Technobis, uh, Crystallization Science and Agrochemical Formulations, and we look forward to seeing you, some, some of you there. And of course, as I said before, 
uh, we will send you details of where you can find the recording and the slides to this presentation. So thank you very much for attending today. Thank you and goodbye.